Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome back to CarmelCast. <clears throat> CarmelCast is a production of the Institute of Carmelite Studies Publications. For more information, you can visit our website at icspublications.org. And right now we're uh, doing a book study or a read-through of The Living Flame of Love by St. John of the Cross. Uh, we're working through this new study edition that we recently released, uh, written by the late Father uh, Kieran Kavanaugh. It's really an, an ex excellent walkthrough this work of St. John of the Cross. And today we're going to continue where we left off from the last episode, and we're going to start uh, stanza three. So we're going to read through and discuss the first half of stanza three. And I'm Brother John Mary of Jesus Crucified, and I'm joined today by Father Michael Joseph of St. Therese. Hello. Hello. Good morning. How are you doing? Very well, very well. Good, good. All right, so stanza three. Um, this is a, a, a difficult stanza, I think, yeah. and John acknowledges that right at the beginning. This, this first paragraph, he mm -hmm. makes this, this big point of asking God for help because mm -hmm. he says this is a difficult stanza to yeah. understand. So hopefully we're asking for the the grace of the Holy Spirit, too, to help us to, to to even just discuss this. Yes, exactly. And hopefully, even if we haven't maybe experienced everything that the stanza talks about, um, we can get some sense of what John means and, and what can help enlighten our own experience, whatever that has been. Enlighten is a good word yeah, <laughs> to use go. there. Because yeah. uh, right off, th that's that's what the beginning of the stanza is about, <clears throat> is about light. Mm -hmm. uh, the, first, the first line of the poem there, O lamps of fire. Um, right away we get into this idea of, of light. Yeah, and the light is something living in a way too. It's, it's not just light that, that we have that you know, just illumines things, but there's something almost substantial to this light, to these lamparas mm -hmm. that enable, it's, it's not just giving you know, clarity in a sense, but it's, it's something that's enabling um, you to participate in yes. God in, yeah. a, in a very unique way. Yeah, it's helpful for me to to think back and remember that what John means by lamps is very different than what what I understand a lamp to be. I think yeah. of just like a desk lamp that's yeah. sitting there, um, and and or like even like today, most of our a lot of our lamps are LED lamps, mm -hmm. and that's very different than what John's talking about because we don't usually associate fire with a lamp mm -hmm. unless something is going like terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and for John. The, a lamp would have been, you know, a gas lamp probably, so it would have had a flame. Mm -hmm. Or an oil lamp. Or an oil, yeah, an oil right. lamp, sorry. Yeah, and so it would have had a, a live flame. Um, and so flames would necessarily be associated with lamps. Mm -hmm. And connected to that is, uh, for us, lamps are, like a desk lamp, are usually not essential uh, to seeing. Um, but in his time at, at night or, or in a, a dark room, it would be the only way to see. Yeah. They couldn't have pulled out their, their, you know, their phone or they wouldn't have had overhead lights or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. so John's understanding of lamp is uh, uh, very, it's, it's more essential and, and more connected to the flame too. Mm -hmm. An another thing is uh, because it was a live flame, it would give off a lot of heat as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas again, we would say, if my lamp is giving giving off heat, there might be something Sounds wrong right. with it. Yeah. So yeah, you think just danger, danger. <laughs> yes, yeah. But so I guess light and heat seem so connected to this, uh, and fire yeah. seems so connected to this understanding of lamp. Yes, for John and, on the cross. And Father Kieran points out that you know we tend to just look at mysticism or mystical knowledge as as, as a loving knowledge, which mm -hmm. which it is, um, but that. You know, you can have loving knowledge communicated to you from the beginning. I mean, that's how we, we grow in the spiritual life is through that communication as we, especially as we draw deeper into contemplation and a more contemplative type of praying. But that John wants to talk about something, you know, that's not, you can't just reduce it to loving knowledge. It's not just like a kind of basic way that God communicates to the soul, that it's something, you know, much deeper, or it is loving knowledge, but on a different degree, in a different level, where he says in, in number eight of this third stanza the soul becomes god from god through participation in him and in his attributes which it terms the lamps of fire so that this loving knowledge is something that's actually you know bring us making us transforming us into god through participation yes yeah. yeah yeah so i mean even that idea of loving knowledge is um that's just essentially who God is. Mm -hmm. Like he just is. It, it's not that God's communicating something uh, separate from himself. He's just communicating who he is. Yeah. And he's always doing that. Again, this is just the flame, like from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It's communicating to us, no matter where we are in the spiritual life. But the intensity or the, um, 
the depth of that is changing. Mm -hmm. And so here, uh, this, this soul that's been touched substantially, um, the substance of the soul has touched the substance of God. There's, uh, there's the communication has become so intimate and so intense that it's, it's this, this whole new idea that really that John's talking about. Yes. And even that term substance of the soul, it might be helpful to define that mm -hmm. in a way that or at least Father Kieran um, mentions in the study guide. What is the substance of the soul? It is the interior principle that works or receives with total independence from the senses and faculties joined to it. Um, so it's, it's something that's deeper than just our, our faculties of thinking, of willing, of memory, as mm -hmm. you mentioned in the last episode, intellect, um, that, that it's, it's this interior principle that's almost independent. Um, it's so deep, you know, it's, it's, it's so much more at the basis of who we are than even the, the way that, that it expresses itself in our actions or in our faculties of, of the soul. And so, yeah, so you're thinking God is touching the deepest part of us, mm -hmm. you know, with the deepest part of him. Yes. And in the, in these lamparas that, that, are, that are actually enabling us to become God through participation. Right. Yeah. And these, I mean, these lamps then, I mean, you, you already mentioned it, but they're the attributes of God. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, when we think of an attribute of something, it's, it's kind of secondary. And when we think of natural things in the world, it's kind of secondary to what the thing really truly is it's separate from its its um essence mm. for example so like i can say like oh i can imagine a rock and a rock has all of these attributes or qualities but they're not uh the essence of what the rock is mm. but it's different with god because um well here's a quiz for you uh we're talking about uh you know these these attributes of god which is something that's been talked about throughout theological uh the, throughout the tr theological tradition yeah and St. Thomas Aquinas talks about these, you know, all the great theologians. But for Thomas Aquinas, there's one attribute that's the primary mm -hmm. when it comes to who God is. Mm -hmm. Do you, have, do you know, have a guess as to what? I would say existence. No, no, no. <laughs> Being goodness. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I should know this. I do. It's yeah. somewhere. It's somewhere deep down. Yeah, it's simplicity. 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 Yeah. And, and that doesn't mean that God is... is like simple in the sense of like not intelligent or or um, uh, I don't know it not simple in that way. Yeah. What it means to say that God is simple is that he's he's totally one, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because that's where John's starting too when talking about these attributes. John's a good a good theologian. He's saying all of these attributes in God are one, mm -hmm. and they're not dis they're not separate from just who he is in himself. So. Um, you know, he lists, John lists some of these attributes. He lists, you know, like you said, goodness and existence. He lists all these things, wisdom. These are all um, characteristics of God, but they're not distinct from each other. And um, because God is, is so, is, is one, he's united. They're, they're not, they're, they're all connected and they're all just who he is in yeah. himself. Yes. So we don't say God is good. Well, we do say that, but we don't say um it in the same way we would about a person yeah. we'd say god is goodness itself yeah. it's not that god is wise god is wisdom yes. god is god is all of these things and so his. through each one you can see all of them then. exactly like his it, saying god is good through his goodness we also see his wisdom we also see his his beauty you know that it's all yeah, yes. it's all one and this goes back to something we talked about in an earlier episode but so often we see those things as separate or sometimes even in, con in, in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. And yet in God, his mercy and his power and his um, compassion and his love, like all of these are just uh, all one and the same. Yeah. And they're all this loving knowledge, which again, it's not something separate from, it's just, it's just him. Mm -hmm. It's just him communicating himself. Yeah, it's that we have to make distinctions in a sense too, to help understand yes. and different things. and and. And not that there's not an objective kind of way of, you know, looking at God through these different attributes, but, um, but that we need to be able to, you know, for our own understanding, we often make these distinctions that, but that can end up can hindering sometimes to our, our true grasp of, right. Of yeah. God's simplicity. Yeah. I think a good image for this is, um, it's like God's, God is communicating himself. He's like this light, uh, this one single beam of light, totally simple. And yet when it shines through a prism, or something, it, it radiates all these different attributes. And so they're all contained within the one 
being of who God is, mm-hmm. and yet we can receive them in different ways. Yeah. But when we receive one, we're actually receiving all of them. Yeah. Um, and so the difference for, you know, the experience of the soul here is being inflamed in this um, this lofty experience. But I think we can relate it to our lives here and now. So there are times when we resonate more with one of the attributes of God than another, maybe his beauty, maybe his goodness, mm. maybe his compassion. <clears throat> and so it's like, and I think when that happens, it's an invitation to let that one lay of, ray of light to just shine on us and know that like, as we're growing, as we're being warmed and, and, and illumined by that ray, that um, we're also like growing in and in, in receiving all of the others as well. Mm-hmm. It's just that there's God at times, I think, allows us to receive a particular uh, attribute or to resonate with a particular attribute of him. Yeah, and you can see that I think in certain of other of our of our saints in the Carmelite tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, I think especially of Saint Therese, where she the attribute of mercy became the attribute that through which she yes. she saw everything else. And in a way too, it, it, she it showed us too that that is a proper way. Like I mean that that's a very biblical way mm-hmm. too of looking at God through His mercy. That's a, in a way it's His highest attribute we'd say again without without messing up the simplicity of God, yes. but that through that attribute of merciful love. We can see his justice, you know, we can see his power. We can, it, it kind of makes those understandable in so, like they reflect more of the, the, the reality of God in that way, the truth of God right. through that attribute. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so the soul here though in the living flame is, and, and really the, all of us um, the, in the glory of heaven, we will receive all of these attributes at once. Mm. Um, so it's in a, in a different way. Like now we tend to perceive them usually as more individual, um, or one will shine on us more than another. We'll notice one more than another. But the soul here and the soul, or in, and, and all the souls in, in the beatific life in heaven will just receive all of who God is all at once. Um, and in that, see still all the different attributes, yes. but see them all as one. Yeah, and, and it's inexhaustible too. Yes. So it's like you're, and John says it's really interesting. He names certain attributes and then he says, and an infinite more that we yes. don't even know. Right. We don't yeah. even, we haven't even discovered yet. I couldn't call and you think, wow, because how many more could you come up with with an infinite more, you yes. know, different attributes that will just be inexhaustible in our, in glory that yeah. we just keep going deeper. I love there's this section uh, when he's talking about these attributes where he's, you know, he's, he's relating it to fire. And then he, he uh, just has this exclamation where he says, oh, marvelous thing that the soul at this time is flooded with divine waters. Mm. And so he he's, he switches like instantly. It's like, where is this coming from? This idea of divine waters. You're just yeah. talking about fire, and we experience we think of fire and water as almost opposites, um, and yet they both contain a lot of the same the same uh, characteristics, right? Sure. Water water and fire both can be like very powerful. Um, they're both they they both can also be very gentle. Mm-hmm. They can both, uh, I think of like the kind of the beautiful, like fluid movements of both of them too. Mm-hmm. So I think it's cool that John's bringing in these two sides of fire and water. And he's basically using that to show that then these lamps cover the entire spectrum yeah. of, of who God is. Um, the entire spectrum spectrum of existence from, you know, God is totally imminent and totally transcendent. He's mercy and he's justice, he's power, he's compassion. So he's all these things that we experience at times as contradictory all at the same time. Yeah. And and our goal then is to um, to rest in this this fullness of who God is and to, to receive it um, for the sake of then shining it forth. Yes. And, and, and it gives insight too into why John had recourse to poetry, mm-hmm. you know, because in a way poetry is the, uh, I heard it described as the least inadequate way of kind of describing these realities that are, that are ineffable or these realities that are, are, you know, beyond our limited comprehension. And so John will use these distinctions. Like you could say, well, and even we hear in, in Pentecost in the sequence for Pentecost that the Holy Spirit is the fire that cools and refreshes, right? Mm-hmm. Or the, the water that we receive that, that burns in us so that we you know of love for love for God. So, so yeah, so poetry can be a great means of expressing these kind of realities that when you just sort of describe them, Yes. Often it can fall short. Right. Yeah, exactly. That brings us then into the the second line of the poetry then. So the first was, uh, lamps of, O lamps of fire, and the second, in whose splendors. 
And, and these splendors then that John speaks of are just, um, they are that, that loving knowledge. They are that heat and light that is the communication of who God is. But what's interesting about this is that, like I said um, earlier, that the, so when, when we think of a lamp, the light and the, the heat are something that are coming from it, that are almost like secondary to it, like the effects of it. Whereas what he's saying is that this light and warmth is not like that produced like from material lamps um, in which the lights, the, the light and the, the heat like radiate from it. He's speaking, the splendors are just the heat and the light themselves that are contained within it. So it's, it's so like essential to what it is. It's not something that's uh, diminishing as it's going out. It's just the very heat and light itself. Mm-hmm. And that the soul, too, is, is the, in a sense, the air that kind of feeds the flame, right? Yes. Right. So it's not like we're a soul, like, here's a lamp and here's me, and it's, sh- it's shedding its heat and light um, on me. That might be the case for, like, us now, the unpurified soul, the, the soul that's not totally united to God. But when we're united to God, we're brought into that mm. so that there's no distance anymore between the, the, the flame the the heat and the light yeah. and in us yes yeah. so just as the 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 air is drawn into it you know and fuels it so we're so much a part of it now yes. that that and it, and it kind of helps um in a way resolve a little bit of that distinction too between like what we do and what god does right mm-hmm. father kieran addresses in the study guide somewhat like this kind of you know understanding of how much it's you know god at work and then how much the the person has work and he says The soul is like the air within the flame, enkindled and transformed in the flame. For the flame is nothing but enkindled air. The movements and splendors of the flame are not from the air alone or from the fire of which the flame is composed, but from both air and fire. So it just shows like our full participation in this is not like inert, I guess. It is is fully us, and yet it's something that where God is the one who's the you know, the prime actor in yes. this, in this, in this cooperation, in this transformation. Yeah. And, and I actually think Father Kieran points out, and I have to agree with him. He says like, this is the best explanation of what, what it is to me to be united to God. Like he says, this is the best image, this yeah. idea of the, the air that's being um, drawn into the fire. And then it it's the fire is nothing else than the, the air, yeah. a flame. So there, there's, there's just like so, there's, there's no longer that distinction there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's like a really good image. I think that comes from, I think it's paragraph nine of uh, John's commentary or around there. So mm-hmm. um, Father Kieran quotes it kind of in full as well. But I think that's a good section to reread yeah. and to just, you know, reflect on in, in prayer. Because I think that really is like maybe the best image that John of the Cross gives. It's kind of building on the whole. So earlier we had the log. Is wet at first. It's been purified. It's been dried, and then eventually the log is totally consumed. Okay. But there's still this fire, and it's all that remains is the air, mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's that's what we're called to be. Is this? It's it's this uh, openness and receptivity, um, and just like capacity to receive God. Yes, and capacity it, to burn. Exactly, and that doesn't just start when we've already reached mystical union. You know yes. that 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 is. The reality that is always true is always there, but that the mystics, especially John, has a, have have an ability to kind of see it more clearly in in the state of you know being so close to God, of being so united, of being so much at His center. He's able to see this reality, but it it illuminates all of our experiences that yeah. that we can see kind of our role to play in in the life of grace, you yeah. know, with this kind of image. And this, this is what it means to cooperate with grace. Exactly. Yeah, and and like a few things are stating here, um, this cooperation, this capacity to receive, just being the heir, uh, reminds me of Our Lady. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's kind of a good transition to the the next theme that John brings up too, because he, he explains that these splendors are also called overshadowings. Mm-hmm. And it takes him a while. Actually, maybe right away he relates it to Mary. But um, these overshadowings, I mean, they, they reference, you know, Luke's gospel of, of saying that the Holy Spirit, you know, overshadowed Mary. Yeah. And so right away she's brought forward as this example to us. Yes, that, that she's a – and and we might have mentioned this before, I think you did in the last episode, that Mary's kind of 
um, some will say that that all of l- the living flame of love is about the soul of Mary. Mm-hmm. You know, she's the she's the exemplar of what John is talking about. Um, and so in this in this section, you get an explicit reference to her, um, but that really the whole living flame could be seen as a as a kind of manifestation of the interior life of Mary. Um, and so yeah, so this overshadowing then the splendor. Um, he says that. The, it's protecting, it's a favoring, um, and it means that the other person is very near when you overshadow, you know, mm-hmm. and you could see this in a, in a scary way too if you think you're by yourself and you just see the shadow come over you. Like, you know, everyone's very close to you, closer. But, but with God, of course, like that, it means God is so close in this overshadowing um, that, our, that Our Lady is the exemplar of, but that um, the, the overshadowing, the splendor casting its shadow on us is also the reality that's happening, you know, with the soul in this state. Yeah, and the, the idea of a shadow maybe is kind of a strange one to use here, but I'm glad that John uses it because it does bring that element of Our Lady into it. But because what basically what's happening is it's a shadow, but you know, as the light gets closer and closer to the object, um, the shadow also it kind of collapses until it's all just just one. Mm-hmm. And that's the image that John's saying is like. The, the Holy Spirit is so close to the soul that his shadow not only touches it, but it just like is united to it. Yeah. And so the shadow just becomes a part of, the, and, and our, again, Our Lady is the example of, of that unity that's mm-hmm. taking place between the soul. Um, all of God's attributes just become a part of who she is mm-hmm. and then radiate from her such that it's, it's God that's radiating out of her, but it's also who she is that's yeah. radiating out to, into the world. Yeah, and to it, and it's it's again that participation because as John says, the shadow casts like it's kind of like a a, a different sort of light, right? Like if a if a if an object is is very opaque and dark, then the shadow is going to be very opaque and dark. But if the object is lighter and kind of thinner and sh- kind of a sheer yes. sort of substance, then the, the when the light comes behind it, the shadow will be illuminated. And God, so God is you know pure light in that mm-hmm. way. So the shadow of God is going to be his illumination. So again, right. it's like, because we don't think of shadows as illuminating. Like shadow, yeah. yeah, yeah. But but no, it's illuminating us, and it's God himself in shadow, you mm-hmm. know, and that's, I like how John says that. It again, shows the, the participatory aspect. It's not we're trying to, you know, make God in the soul one without any kind of distinction anymore. That, yes. no, it's God, but in shadow, you know, in this state, you know. Yes. It's still God, but in shadow, who's who's drawing the the person into his attributes into mm-hmm. his life. Yeah. And and uh, maybe before we go on to the next uh, line, though, I could give a little plug for, there's a book that I've, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I haven't read the whole thing yet. I'm about three-fourths of the way through now, but there's this book, Mary the Perfect Contemplative, that ICS put out recently and uh, by Barbara Hughes. And it's really helped me to see um, how it is that when in, whenever John's talking about the perfect soul, he has Mary in mind mm-hmm. to some degree. If even if not explicitly, it's implicit in what he's saying. Oh yeah. Um. So it's just yeah, it's a beautiful. I've I found it really beautiful to pray with. I've really enjoyed it so far. So I definitely recommend that Mary the Perfect Contemplative, yeah. Carmelite Insights on the Interior Life of Our Lady. Yeah. It's a very good book, and that helps us understand John too in a way. You know, yes. knowing Mary's experience helps us understand. Okay, what John is talking about, the concreteness of it, the exactly. reality of it, and what we're what we're called to, but also what we're participating in here and now. Yes. All right. Well, maybe let's move then to the the next line, which is probably where things get a little bit more tricky. And this is the deep caverns feeling. (laughs) Um, This is, it's complicated, this this section. Um, But I think it's also very important. Yeah. Well, first just understand that caverns of senses, you know, and feelings that he's talking about, um, that the living flame talks about it in a in a unique way you know you you have a sense that we don't want to make our journey to god that of the the senses right that of just our our kind of thinking and sensing and 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 sort of our limited way of approaching reality you know based on our kind of creaturely way um that that's not the way we go to god Mm -hmm. in the end i mean that's a good start and we need to kind of have our senses and our you know, thoughts evangelized in a sense, um, and brought, you know, more and more into being able to approach God. But at a certain point, we have to almost kind of let go, mm-hmm. you know, we, or we at least have to not rely on them so much as defining our relationship with God. Yes. Um, but then it's like, okay, and so then you sort of pass through that stage of kind of being more detached from the senses in a way, to then the living flame where it's like, 
then he talks all about feelings, you yes. know, and these caverns of sentido. And yeah, um, well, maybe you could say something about that Spanish word, even. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because sentido is is the Spanish word there for the deep caverns of, of feeling. Mm -hmm. That's the, the word for feeling. Yeah. But maybe even feeling is not the the best translation. Or I don't know what it, could you illuminate? Like, what does that word mean? Yeah, sentido has. I mean, it has feeling. It has also kind of the sense of meaning too yeah. um, in Spanish. And and I think. The cavernas de sentido also have a sense of like the senses too, of just like so you're the the sensing way almost sensing exactly yeah. the way you're experiencing or experiencing yeah yeah and and so the 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 caverns you know are are these yeah are this like our capacity mm -hmm. I guess to to feel to see to sense so when John of the Cross then is talking about these these caverns of feeling he's not talking about a cavern of of uh, kind of our exterior feelings, our very fleeting feelings, but rather he's talking about something very interior. It's the way that we ex can experience God um, through these caverns, uh, which he kind of enumerates here in, in this um, this section. Mm. Yeah, and the caverns really, and we, he always goes back to it, the powers, right? The powers of the soul, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the memory, the understanding, and the will, and that they... Are profound the depth is profound because they have an infinite capacity because we're spiritual beings right you know so there's an infinite capacity there and when they attach to a created thing um that that kind of holds them back you know yes. from knowing from experiencing their sort of infinite capacity and the 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 sort of emptiness in a good way that they're called to for god right. and um it's kind of like uh, at least father pierre giorgio mentioning last last episode of the of using your Maserati to go to the grocery store. Yes. You know, so we have these infinite capacities and we don't want to attach them to something because what he's saying then, it, it prevents us from the hunger from for God. Exactly, yeah. That's that's attached to, or that's kind of of their essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's like, so this purification has been taking place where we're no longer depending on our exterior senses or even like, um, our more surface level feelings or imaginations to go to God because those things can't can't reach God in himself right I can't see God with my 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 physical eyes I can't touch God with my physical hands so we've been purified in that way and now we're coming down to like the most inner part of who we are our spiritual selves and that's what these deep caverns are which John enumerates as you know the intellect memory and will yeah. those have the capacity because they're infinite. That's what John's saying, these infinite caverns. They they are the one part of us that does have the capacity to to be united to God in himself. Mm -hmm. The rest of us will, will participate in that, but it's through means of this spiritual part of us, um, which is infinite. And that's, I mean, first of all, that's what's incredible about the human person, that we were created with this infinite capacity. Yeah. It's something that's beautiful. It's, it's why... Um, the human person is such great worth. Mm -hmm. And it gives us a insight too into kind of our own experience of often of pain or people who are um, stuck in addiction or different things is because we've, we have this infinite worth, this infinite dignity that we then kind of, you know, attach to something that's so much lower than what we're called to. Yes. You know, and, and if I think this can be a helpful thing for people maybe to see that, to not be afraid of the emptiness that they might feel mm -hmm. when they don't satisfy what they're seeking, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, so often we run from emptiness or we run or we run to things that will just sort of, you know, be a, be a very temporary fix. Right. But, but this is a good, what John describes here is saying like, no, like we want to know that our caverns are infinite and to have this emptiness and have this almost like unquenchable thirst at times. And so to be able to rest in that, when mm -hmm. we do experience that in our, on our own level, you know, yes. and that we don't have to run from that and we don't yeah. have to try to fill it with something else. It's like, you can be okay with that because that shows that we're being created. I mean, we are, we have this capacity for God. Yeah. I often think of, um, when I think of infinite caverns, I think of the Grand Canyon. Mm. I think you and Pier Giorgio, Father Pier Giorgio went there uh, at some point recently, right? Yeah, so a couple you, years back. Yes, yeah, so you've seen the Grand Canyon and it's, I mean, it's, it's a huge hole. <laughs> like, that's what it is. Yeah. And um, I think... So similar to that, the Maserati image is I think that this, this cavern is what, this is our soul. Like we have this incredible capacity and yet um, we try to fill it up with like, it's like we're trying to fill it up, but we're trying to take like 
uh, a fire or a a, a, a garden hose yeah. and like try to fill it up, you know, or we're trying to take like a shovel and just like fill it in where I'm going to fill up this hole with this yeah. shovel. And it's like, this is never going to work. <clears throat> Even if I were to get like, you know, uh, a million garden hoses or a million people shoveling, like I still wouldn't fill up this hole yeah. within my lifetime. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to fill it with the things of the world, with these things that aren't always bad. They can mm, be good exactly. things. Exactly. Yeah. And very often they are good things. Um, but they can also be addictions. They can be, I mean, there's many other things. We, just busyness, distractions. Yeah. We try to fill up this hole. The this... infinite scroll, you know? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> the infinite scroll of whatever it is. Social media. Or... I know, and it'll <laughs> never fill us. It'll always leave us, it'll just leave us tired and frustrated and feeling um, more, uh, yet yeah, not at peace, more disturbed. Yeah. And so what what we're really called to, though, is to, to empty that out and just sit in that emptiness yeah. because it's there that will then uh, open ourselves to be filled by God because he's the only one that can fill a, a cavern that's that's so expansive yes and to not to not uh, give in to that kind of the tragedy of them thinking no I, I I'm okay you know yes. like I, I I have my little shovel I mean I have my little dirt that I'm putting in the Grand Canyon and I'm and I'm doing okay I don't need yeah maybe. well and I think that's where many people are in the world is like we're shoveling away and it's we're just busy yeah. like we're keeping ourselves busy but eventually we're going to hit that wall yeah. where we get so fatigued from the shoveling <clears throat> and it's going to we're going to break down mm -hmm. and that can be a grace like that can be the moment where we realize like okay this isn't working oh, yeah. but we're we just keep ourselves so distracted or um medicated in a sense uh that we we don't even notice the the impossibility of the task that we're trying to do yes and i know it's it's the the heartbreak for a lot of parish priests or other people, preachers, things that, that are just awakening people to the need, you know, yeah. like just to know that you are a cavern and that you need God mm -hmm. and you need God to fill you. And people can go to mass their whole lives, you know, or, or at least, you know, participate, you know, in their faith in different ways. And without being awakened to that, like, no, I, I really do need, yes. need to be filled. I need God to fill me. Yeah. And nothing else will do it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, maybe we can expand a little bit then on the particular like caverns that John's talking about here, because um, he kind of helpfully breaks it down into these different capacities that we have, yeah. because he says that, you know, the, the first cavern is the intellect. The second is the will. And the third is the memory. And we talked a little bit in the last episode. We kind of introduced these topics, the idea that um, these capacities are powers of our soul are not... Um, they're not uh, things or like parts of our soul. They're they're rather just um, they're they're that they're just powers or capacities. They're the ways that our soul can can act, mm -hmm. and it's really what distinguishes us from from uh, like animals, for example, um, mm -hmm. because we have these capacities, these infinite capacities. Our souls are capable of understanding. Mm -hmm. Our souls are capable of of loving, and these uh, movements. Are again, we can we can focus them on the things of the world, very limited things, or we can focus them on God, and there, that's the only way that will be fulfilled in this life. Yes. Maybe we can go a little bit deeper then into each of these caverns or each of these capacities then uh, of the soul, the intellect, memory, and and the will. Um, so John says that the first, you know, the first cavern is the intellect, and he says it's it's a void. Its void is a thirst for God, and so. I think for me, it's helpful to, to see that by our human, um, okay, so our, our intellect is our, our soul's power to understand something. And by our human, uh, our, our kind of limited, finite human nature, we can understand many things, right? We can um, understand simple things, such as like how to tie my shoes, or I can understand very complex things like calculus um, or like neuroscience or something like that. But in this finite way of using our intellects, we can't understand God because God is infinite and he's so far beyond our abilities to understand in a natural, like finite way. But this is where faith comes in um, because by means of faith, which is a kind of a supernatural virtue, it raises the capacity of our intellects so that we can understand God, um, not completely in this life in like a very clear way, but in sort of like a dark, obscure, mysterious way. Um, however, the problem is we tend to cling to that natural way of understanding mm -hmm. because uh, it's comfortable. It's what we're used to. 
And so we stick to like our own incomplete ideas about who God is and about what he's capable of doing in our lives. But our ideas about God are not God himself. They're, they're by nature, they're, they're limited, they're finite. And so I, to me, this is like we're trying to see something that's a million miles away using our natural eyes. Yeah. Um, instead, though, we need the help of this like telescope of faith that raises our capacity so that we can truly, um, through faith, that we can truly understand God and participate in him in that way. Yeah, and it's it's. I think it's helpful to point out too that it's not just us kind of spinning our wheels. It's not just sort of thinking, thinking that it's going to get me to God, you know. And just if I can just get as many great ideas as I could from any book or from whatever, then I'll like get closer to God somehow. But it's saying like, no, like we need, yeah, we need, and it kind of changes the way we approach it too. Mm-hmm. This telescope of faith yes. means that it's not just me sort of getting there trying to run to God a million miles away, it's like, it just, it's a, it's a, it's a different way of sort of approaching him as well. Right. Yeah. And, and so then the memory, um, and the memory is maybe a little more complicated in, in our understanding today because of how we understand what the memory is. But, um, the memory is really our, our soul's power, our soul's, soul's capacity to like recall, um, and to like possess something. Um, yeah, it's not just an archive. No, exactly. Right. Yeah. It's this power that we have. So something that animals don't have, right? We have a power, um, to, to recall something, to hold something in our minds. Um, whether that thing is something that might be in the future, in the present or the past. And, um, you know, by our, this, our natural, like human abilities, we have this, this way that we can possess many things in our minds. We can possess like, you know, the things that happened many years ago. Or we can hold in our minds, you know, even just the words that I just said five seconds ago. Mm -hmm. Um, Yet our natural human memory on its own, um, in a natural way, cannot possess God. Again, because God is so far beyond our ability to contain um, in our minds. And so this is where the, the theological virtue of hope comes in. And by means of hope, which hope is a supernatural virtue, uh, our memories are raised so that we can possess God. Um, not completely in this life again, uh, like like with the intellect, there's kind of this mysterious kind of dark way in which we possess God here and now through this virtue, um, but in a very real way still nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And the problem like the intellect again is that we tend to cling to our natural ways of using our memories because they're comfortable, that's what we're used to. Yeah. And so we constantly, like we recall times of, of hurt from our past or embarrassment, um, or we f- uh, are constantly recalling or, or worrying about anxieties from the future. And we let that these things define who we are and instead of being present to God who's present with us in the present. Yeah. Um, and so an image of this for me is like, this is like we're trying to cling to a handful of change we're trying to hold this change. We don't want to give up this change, all these coins, uh, when God's offering us like, you know, a million dollars or something like that. We're just, we're unwilling to let go, but we have to let go of the change in order to receive the great gift of, and it's through hope then that we can receive. God God allows us to to empty and receive that gift. Yeah, and I think it's helpful you point out too that it, this is a, a spiritual faculty, so it's not like animals have memory in a certain sense, like in right. an analogical sense, they have a kind of impression Yes. that sticks with them. We know elephants, right? Like yes. after years, you know, have remember, so to speak, what happened to them yeah. when they were little or something, and then they flip out, you know, and, uh, yes. but, but that, um, but that, that human <clears throat> capacity of memory is distinct in that it can actually define how we will, um, expect things in the future mm-hmm. and, and it helps and we anticipate in a way too. So, yes. so we, if we, if we hold on to something, like you said, that change. And let's say God gave us that change, right? It could, could, be, even a, yeah, change. It could be a very good thing. Yeah, yeah, God gave us that change 20, 40 years ago when I was in second grade CCD, you know? <laughs> he gave me this change. And and I'm just going to hold on to that because that's all I got, you know? And whereas if we can let go of some of those memories, even the good ones, mm-hmm. I mean, if we can let go of, of that, that need to possess, then we can expect that God will give us so much, something so much better. Like it, or we don't have to think, well, all God wants to give me is change. But yes. that's what happens when we hold on in our memory, right? We yes. just, it conditions our yes. expectations of the future too. Exactly. And we think, no, this is not for me or nothing goes right in my life or something. And it, mm-hmm. it kind of undermines 
God's ability to surprise us and to like bring us to something so much greater. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So then moving on to the last, the third cavern, the will. Um, and this is really the soul's power to love or, or, and also in a way to choose. And, um, once again, by, by our kind of limited human way of using our will, uh, we can love many things. We can love things that are both good for us and things that are bad for us. We can love, you know, our spouses, our children, um, or we can love things like pleasure or power, um, things that ultimately end up harming us. Yet, uh, our human nature on its own, um, our wills cannot love God. It, they're incapable because God is, again, infinite. He's beyond our capacity to truly love um, by in this natural way. Mm. But this is where the, the theological virtue of charity comes in. And this is what John of the Cross explains is that um, through charity, this supernatural virtue, our wills are raised so that we can love God. Um, again, not totally perfectly in this life, but in this kind of um, incomplete uh, dark way here and now, but it's still a very real way. Um, however, once again, we try, we tend to cling to our natural, uh, limited way and love things in this world because they're comfortable, they're, they're, they're familiar to us. And um, these things that we love, these finite things in the world, they cannot, like we said earlier, they cannot satisfy this infinite longing that we have. They just cannot fill that. And so an image of this to me is like, this is like eating fast food when we're being offered like a gourmet meal. Mm. The fast food kind of may satiate us um, in the moment, but it'll kind of ultimately leave us feeling hungry again in a very short time. Um, while the, the gourmet meal of God's love is this, it will just fill us entirely so that we're never hungry again. Mm. But we need the help of charity uh, to choose to love God above all of these other things. Yeah, no, and, and John even points out in a couple other spots, there's a letter to a religious um, where it's a beautiful thing. How he says, what our will grasps for is what we, or what we can grasp as good, you know? So something yes. that we can enjoy in a sense. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but God is so beyond our power to grasp. You yes. know, he, we can't enjoy him in the same way as we can enjoy another like finite thing. Yes. And so our will, you know, tends to then just grasp at what we can enjoy. Mm -hmm. And until we were able to let go of some of that, like, of just realizing that I can love something that's so much beyond me because, like you said, I have this gift of charity, mm -hmm. this gift of charity that makes me able to love with God's own love. Yes. Because you could have a natural knowledge of God too, let's say, or a philosophical knowledge of God and kind of love him yeah. as the source of all good, so to speak. But you can't love him with that Trinitarian, Christian, you know, Christ-like love yeah. of his Father that that the gift of charity enables us to do and to grab and to to love something that maybe we can't grasp. Yes. You know? Yeah. And this, this lays out the kind of the entire, the, the entire spiritual life for John of the Cross. It's this process of learning or cooperating with God's grace to, to let go of the limited natural ways of, of, um, loving of, of understanding and to allow God to work in us. Mm -hmm. And it's ultimately something we can't do on our own. It's something we just make ourselves receptive to and allow God to work in us. This is where God steps in too to kind of bring it to, it's another image now of like this matrimonial union, mm -hmm. you know, and how, how these caverns of Santito um, give way to the sense of God preparing us for something so much greater, mm -hmm. you know, the first a betrothal to yes. himself and then eventually to the spiritual marriage. Yes. So maybe, I don't know if you could maybe share some on the, the distinction and what God is doing in this process. Yeah, John just, I mean, he kind of ends this section here that we're talking about today by distinguishing between this, these ideas that you mentioned, the spiritual betrothal and the spiritual marriage. And the soul here in the living flame that we're re reading about has reached this final stage of the spiritual marriage. And, um, you know, the, the idea of betrothal is very a different uh, concept than our understanding of, like, engagement today. Um, you know, in 16th century Spain, the time that John's talking about, it's, it's really the time that the the details of the wedding contract were were worked out, and between the you know the families of the couple, and that John explains that there were these visits, there are these visits that are made um, by the uh, the spouses to one another to get to know each other, um, but there is not yet this union which will take place at the, at the the marriage, and so that's ultimately this marriage is what John's talking about here and what we're all called to. 
um, even in this life. I mean, certainly in heaven, yes, and perfectly in heaven, but even in this life, we're called to this kind of union, this kind of marriage. And the means, the means that this, by which this takes place is this um, uniting our wills, uniting our intellects, uniting our memories to God. Yeah, and he, the, the, the kind of quaint understanding, we, we would say maybe quaint now, of like how, you know, the process was in the 16th century. <clears throat> he talks about betrothal, you know, there are these visits, right? Like you just make these little momentary visits, you might give a gift, yeah. you know, and how what that does is that stirs up this desire, you mm-hmm. know, that this is greater desire for the beloved. Um, and and so then the desire itself, John says, is the the kind of the greatest preparation for entering into spiritual matrimony. Yes. You know, and, and so I think, again, for those of us maybe who aren't quite there yet, maybe at spiritual marriage, we don't know uh, that to stir up the desire, you know, that yeah. that that what God gives you, those gifts he gives you, um, we let our, our desire grow and that that's the best preparation in a way for God to give more gifts. And, and what right. the spiritual marriage is, you know, which is this this total surrender of your gifts to God and God's gifts to you and this yes. total interchange, almost equality mm-hmm. in a sense of, of sharing of of one's self, one's life. Yeah, and that desire is is very often experienced in the emptiness that we're talking about of these caverns. Mm-hmm. And so just to to learn to be to learn to sit in that pl- that space, make the space, clear out the busyness, clear out the noise, yeah. clear out the clutter, allow yourself to just to sit in the silence and the emptiness um, because that's where God is is um, clearing out the space, mm-hmm. increasing that desire so that you can be united to him in this way. All right. Well, great. So this uh, concludes our discussion of the first half of, of stanza three then. And uh, next week we'll be going through the rest of stanza three. If you're interested in uh, seeing, you know, which stanzas we'll be reading for each week uh, in the link of the, down below this, there's a, uh, a reading guide there that you can follow along with. Um, and yeah, we look forward to, to being with you next week. God bless you.